Hey, nature photographers, welcome to another beautiful morning out here in the Davis Mountains. I'm excited to share my topic with you today, which is another part of my series, Sayings to Photograph By. And today's saying is going to be, a vertical subject often warrants a vertical composition. It is amazing to me how many photographers never take the time to even bother thinking about shooting vertically. Now they may crop vertically later, but there's some negatives to that that I'm gonna talk about. So today, whether you're shooting landscape, macro, wildlife, birds in flight, all kinds of nature photography subjects, night sky in particular, vertical subjects often warrant a vertical composition. So let's hop inside, take a look at some images and talk about this. Howdy from West Texas. I'm Lee Hoy, professional nature photographer, and this is my YouTube channel, Lee Hoy Photography. I'm an OM system ambassador, photography workshop instructor for wild side nature tours of precision camera and video, and contributing author for the Journal of Wildlife Photography. All right, let's talk about some of the benefits and some of the challenges when it comes to shooting vertically. All right, so one of the nice things about shooting a vertical subject uh, that warrants a vertical composition, when we shoot vertical, that means we're not cropping in post and we're not throwing away a ton of pixels and a ton of information. So the beauty of shooting vertically is we are going to keep our image aspect, whichever image aspect you prefer, whether it be four thirds or three, two, whatever. Um, then you're gonna have all of your data. Now, again, I can already hear some people, but Gigapixel, again, guys, my channel and my workshops are how to teach you how to do it right from the beginning. There are a lot of things you can do to fix crap, to fix crappy shots, sure. But I don't like to take crappy shots and make them less crappier. I like to take great shots and make them even better. Now, again, does that mean there aren't times you may not try to save something or do something? You might, but my channel, I'm trying to teach you how to do it really well from the beginning. So shooting vertically, we're gonna keep all the data in our image, and that's a huge benefit to doing that. You won't have to bother with gigapixel. You won't have to bother with losing a lot of pixels. And, and as you're framing vertically, you know, you're know you going to teach your eye how to look at things more importantly over time by doing that. You know, also most magazine covers are vertical images, okay? So, and I realize a lot of you are gonna say, Lee, I'm not shooting for magazine covers. No problem, but realize there's a reason, right? They're, they, they communicate things very differently than a horizontal image. So, one more reason I always keep in mind about shooting vertical is that magazine covers are generally vertical images. Forcing yourself to shoot vertically is going to train your eye and your brain, your creative side, on how to look at things differently. When you flip that camera, already your mind is seeing, perceiving, contemplating things differently, all right? And that's what we wanna do over time is begin to learn to see vertically without even having to flip the camera. So that as you're scanning the environment, whether it be a landscape scene, whether it be a bird, a bird in flight, whether it be wildlife, macro, night sky, you're already training your mind to see that way without having to have the constraints of a viewfinder and a camera. When we shoot vertical landscape shots, those shots often emphasize depth and breadth, right? So they're great with leading lines, they're great with foreground elements, and we're gonna take a look at some images to help bring this notion even more powerfully to you, okay? So, so sometimes a vertical image does much better at portraying depth than a horizontal image. When we shoot vertical landscape images, it's gonna help us incorporate foreground elements even better sometimes, okay? So you can learn to begin to see your foreground element and the background you want behind it, and that same thing's gonna be true for environmental uh, wildlife portraits. That same thing might be true for shooting individuals, isolating them when they're in a group, whether it be a flock or a herd, right? So uh, you're going to begin to see how a vertical image can help bring greater separation, greater distinction because of that breadth in the image. Quite often when I'm shooting panoramic shots, you know, landscape or wildlife, which I do at times, vertical images stitch much better than horizontal images. And, and that's just a, a good practice to develop is shooting vertical shots for uh, 
uh, panoramics, whether it be single row, multi row, whatever, they just tend to stitch better. Uh, I don't always, I don't shoot 100% vertical on my panoramas, but probably somewhere in the 90, low 90% I'm shooting vertical shots. Now, of course, I know there can be some challenges when it comes to shooting vertically. I mean, just from a physical standpoint, it can be more difficult when you don't have a built-in vertical grip. But I think one of the advantages of OM systems is that the cameras are lightweight enough that for landscape, macro, and night sky purposes, because I'm usually using a tripod or handheld, I don't need a built-in vertical battery, battery grip. But on every body that I shoot, whether it be an OM-1, OM-1 Mark II, the EM-1X, like I'm holding right here, which had a built-in uh, vertical grip. If I'm shooting my OM-1 or my OM Mark II, my, my bodies that are designated for uh, wildlife photography, they all have the added BG, BG-10 grip. So having a grip puts the controls here uh, where it's easy for shutter, a couple of buttons and your dial. Um, and these things are, you know, good enough where I can usually make a change while holding it one-handed. Now, if I have a really big lens, that's not going to work. But the built-in vertical grip on the EM1X and the add-on vertical grips on the OM1 and Mark II give you a much greater flexibility. I actually watch clients at times have a built-in vertical grip, and I'm trying to get them to shoot vertical, and I see this. They haven't even trained themselves or thought about the fact they can hold the camera like this. Now, when I first saw the OM-1 being announced at the OM Ambassador meeting, and it didn't have built-in vertical grip, I was initially disappointed. And then when they started telling me about the new features and the upgrades, I was like, oh crap, I don't care. And in fact, now I'm quite happy that they don't have a built-in vertical grip, allowing me the option of having an OM-1 for landscape, macro, that does not have that additional weight. And I normally don't need a second battery for landscape, macro photography, but this isn't that bad because they're so light. Now, I'm not the most flexible guy and I have very short fingers and, and this works great. I can shoot uh, single-handed uh, for macro and landscape like this if need be because I'm in an awkward position or something. So again, just from a physical standpoint, the battery grips make a big difference. I realize for many of you, tracking a moving subject vertically might be a bit more challenging. In that case, if you're using a zoom lens, zoom out, give yourself a little bit more wiggle room, and then you could always crop, oh, and I know you know me, I hate saying that. You can always crop a little bit in post if necessary. I prefer to shoot tight or to shoot as I would like it in the frame. Well, Lee, don't you lose some shots that way? Sure, I do. I do, particularly with birds in flight. But... I get much greater reward from the image that I nail doing it exactly the way I want it than fixing images. It, it just, I, I rarely, occasionally I do, but it just doesn't bring me the same level of satisfaction as looking and going, boom, nailed it. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I realize I am probably in the minority making that statement. And that probably is one thing that makes me a little sad about photography. People just want to jump to other things. Hell with AI, why do you even need to bother getting off your ass and walking outside to take a picture for crying out loud? Just have a computer generated for you. Um, if you do that, and you're watching this channel, go watch another channel. You're, you're not going to want to watch my channel because you're a lazy photographer and you generally lie in your captions because you don't be honest with people and I have no use or tolerance for that. So why don't you hop over and, and enjoy uh, Taylor Swift's ERAS tour on Disney, okay? So yeah, you're gonna have challenges like clipping flying birds, but I still shoot a lot vertically when it comes to birds in flight. So those are some of the benefits and some of the challenges when it comes to shooting vertically. Now what I'd like to do is take you through a walkthrough on some images and explain why I shot them vertically. Again, the saying we're talking about today is a vertical subject often warrants a vertical composition. And sometimes you might even say a vertical scene warrants a vertical composition. Now, when I finish going through these images, what I'm gonna do is show you some of the actual accessories, tools, devices, and, and techniques that make shooting vertically easier, more productive, more enjoyable, all right? And those those accessories, tools, and tips are gonna vary for wildlife, for uh, landscape, night sky, and macro. So we'll take a look at those as well. Nature photographers, what I'm gonna do now in order to help you understand and see the variation in vertical images and why I shot them that way, I've collected a series of landscape, macro, 
mammal and bird images to walk us through and explain the vertical composition and why I chose it for that particular image. So let's jump onto my screen here. I've got quite a few uh, queued up and I'm gonna walk through because every image is a little different. Uh, I know some of you are all here for equipment videos, you know, and I'll be honest in a little way that kind of makes me sad because there's so much more to photography than equipment. And uh, sometimes the people that tend to ignore the videos that don't have anything to do with equipment, probably some of them who need them the most, right? So, you know, there's equipment and then there's the technical side of photography. There's the creative side of photography. There's field craft. There's post-processing. And, uh, you know, sometimes when all you want to do is talk about equipment, sometimes I think you're putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable. So having said that, let's jump in and start taking a look at, at some of these images. This first image is a landscape shot from Great Sand Dunes National Park in Colorado. And as you can see, there's a strong use of leading lines. And those leading lines lead your eye right through that image up into that beautiful stormy sky. And this was a no-brainer in terms of vertical composition. I wanted to emphasize that depth from front to back and have your eyes go from, from the, the beautiful lines there in the sand dune and then the great shade from the edge of the sand dunes all the way up into the dark corner. You see how that dark line leads you right into that darkest area of the sky and then your eye goes back along the clouds. So a vertical composition emphasized that line and, it, and it's a, it, even though the lines are different and they're created different, they work together in this particular image. So that's why I went with the vertical composition on that image. Now here in Big Bend National Park, you'll see that this is a vertical composition. This is a long lens landscape shot. I'm a very long distance from where this was happening. And because of the way the sun, you know, these God rays, I love photographing God rays. And by, by zooming in tight and vertical, I emphasize this dual nature of these God rays. Love this shot. It's simple, uh, yet it's very appealing. It, it, this makes me think of home. This is the kind of summer uh, skies we get. You know, I'm going to be honest. I hear people talk about sunsets all over the world. Big Ben just kicks their all their butts. I mean, I have photographed sunsets all over. And when it comes to beauty, it's really hard to beat the desert mountains of the American Southwest. So uh, again, a nice vertical shot, and your eye just follows that first bright spot and it flows downward, right? I'm not saying you couldn't make a nice horizontal, but this vertical shot emphasizes the God rays as they come down. Here in Yellowstone in winter, of course we have this great geyser going off, and, and a vertical shot allows your eye to travel from the, 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 the beautiful crystals in the snow up through the scene, okay? So our eye naturally wants to go up, and a vertical shot, we, we can just envision, can't we, the continuing cloud of steam even above the edge of the shot. Here again is a rainstorm out here in West Texas near Marathon, Texas. And I went with a vertical shot, nice uh, tight shot. In fact, I hardly have any of my own images on my walls. I'd like more. I just don't have the time to go ahead and print it, be here, hang them. And I have a, a collage of five prints, the only images of mine, and they're all related from this particular rainstorm. And I went vertical here. All the ones on my wall are horizontal, but this particular section, massive thunderstorm in the mountains, I wanted to narrow your view on what was going on in a small part of this storm. This storm was massive, but, and I love the images of the full storm up here on my window, up on my wall. But what I like is a microcosm of this massive storm. You see the heavy sheets of rain, but enough light coming through the sky to backlit the the, the, the rain as it falls and to give that beautiful texture in the mountains. So sometimes a vertical crop can narrow out a lot of other information and bring focus. I love doing long lens landscapes and it was really the American Southwest that forced me into quit thinking about constantly using wide angle shots. And I'll do a video sometime explaining why I love long lens landscapes. So here we're in a vertical composition and what we're seeing is the foreground element is emphasized and your eye follows the, the, the flowers, Dominicia, to what's called the window in Big Bend National Park where the sun sets uh, only a few months out of the year right in the window. So the foreground element gets emphasized and prioritized in this vertical composition. This is a canyon on a four-wheel drive road in Big Bend National Park. 
and all this litter and debris in this little pool. And this pool has had dead mountain lion, dead deer that go in for a drink, fall in. They can't get out. The, the sides are too too smooth. And, and it can really be a it's, a, it's a place for life, but also a place for death in the desert. And this canyon, you walk in quite a ways to get there. And the texture in this, and, and the canyon just leads your eye naturally from the reflection of the sky in the pool all the way back from the shade into the sun. So a black and white emphasizes the contrast and the texture over relatively flat colors during midday. Love this image in black and white. And I, and I shot knowing I was going to go black and white, but uh, would be a very boring image in color. Here's a night sky shot where I went vertical. Obviously, later in the year, the Milky Way is more vertical. Early in the year, it's flatter. So earlier in the year, you want to do your panoramics. Later in the year, the Milky Way gets vertical. And here, the emphasis was on this nipple cactus, and you can giggle a couple of times about that. But this is a really cool cactus found out here in Big Bend. And I'm very low to the ground. I have a very low tripod. I'm using a platypod for this particular shot. And I wanted the Milky Way out of focus, but because the Milky Way's arch, this lent itself much better to a vertical composition than a horizontal composition. Now let's go into some macro. You know, dragonflies tend to perch one of two ways. They either some species sit horizontal and other species sit vertical, and they rarely change it up. So oftentimes a vertical dragonfly will be much better um, captured in an image by shooting it vertical. So again, a vertical subject often, notice I don't say always, often warrants a vertical composition. By often, I do mean far and away the majority of the time. But that's not to say that there aren't beautiful compositions created with a vertical subject and a horizontal composition. Here, I this was a shot from Peru down on the Amazon just a couple of weeks ago. And I'm laying on my belly on a trail shooting up and there's this cool looking uh, uh, fungi stuff growing on this log. And so I wanted to, and this is a crested forest toad. I, I, I wanted the light, you know, I wanted you to feel like you're in a darker forest. And I knew that I want to incorporate some of this cool looking stuff on this log. And I'm down lower than the frog. You know, most shots people take down onto a frog and our eye expects that, but you don't normally expect to see up under a toad or frog. And so that's why I wanted to compose this image. And a horizontal shot would have just included too much useless information. Here um, we have this green link spider, or this is in the Amazon, probably a different species. But it's captured uh, a, a, either a wasp or, a, a, you know, it looks like a wasp, but I don't see a stinger, but not all wasps have stingers. And um, there's these little parasitic flies also feeding. There's two of them feeding on this spider kill. And they were sitting on a leaf that was leaning. It's at an old rundown lodge that, that nobody stays at anymore. It's in ruins. And we go up there and hike around. But the position of the subjects, again, warranted a vertical composition. A horizontal would have included a lot of just meaningless background. And I wanted to emphasize, I love the texture in the leaf. I want to emphasize the parasitic flies as well as the spider. So the spider caught this prey and two other flies are taking advantage of this particular capture, but I like the angle, you know, your eye leads down into this image. Here's in Panama, this particular, the flower itself lent itself to a vertical composition. So you have the flower angling up and to the left, and this is a new fog of Pamelio. It's one of the morphs of uh, strawberry poison dart frog, and it's going, and it's looking to the right. So you have this juxtaposition of leading lines, right? And, and a horizontal would have included too much information not related to those lines. It wouldn't have allowed the emphasis on the color, right? I'd have had a lot less color of the flower. So again, this shot, and this is one of my favorite from Panama, Chris McGinnis, another OM system ambassador, he and I are leading a Panama workshop uh, that we do out on the uh, Bastimentos Island. And you'll see a video on the Wildside Nature Tours channel coming up promoting and talking about that particular workshop. Now, this is a Mojave rattlesnake I found near my house. It's shot with the 150 to 400. This isn't cropped. I shoot close. I know how to deal with rattlesnakes. I've kept most species of venomous snakes in the U.S. at some point in time. And, you know, I wanted to be in tight. I was waiting for the tongue to flicker. And, um, um, you know, one tip on getting a snake to stick its tongue out, blow in its face. That often works. Not always, 
but they'll often stick out their tongue to smell the particles, right? So just a little gentle breeze, even while I'm photographing, I and get ready uh, for that shot. And by shooting vertical, what I like is your eye follows, you know, we go to the eye, our eyes want to go to eyes first, right? And then it follows the tongue down, but then it's going to lead it right back up to the picture where you can see the some of the, the, the snake behind its head as well. So the emphasis is on the face, but both because of the way the snake was laid out, and laid out. It wasn't like I arranged it. Uh, you know, I, I, I've got plenty more tips on how to get work with snakes, but I wanted this to include a lot of the body so you could see the patterning and the detail in the scales. So this is a lizard from um, Costa Rica, and it was sitting on a tree, head down, looking out. And, I, and you know, this just ye yelled vertical composition. And as I watched most of my clients initially, they were just taking horizontal shots because you had to kneel down, it was more physically challenging, but this shot was all about a vertical composition. A horizontal composition cuts off the body, whereas a vertical composition, we go to the eyes, look at that beautiful face, and then we're in, then the body comes up right behind it. So your eye has a natural flow in a horizontal when that body gets cut off, and it's all about just the head. And I like to shoot up tight sometimes just on heads too, but I love this particular composition. Now, this is an image, you know, again, one of the reasons I shoot at fast frames per second. I mean, this baboon, he, he did this grimace very quickly. To be honest, when I was taking the pictures, I didn't even realize I'd captured this. But a vertical shot, this is a nice, tight portrait. This is all about the personality of this particular baboon, not about the environment, not about anything else. I went black and white, even though it looks okay in color, but I knew I'd go black and white because I feel like the facial expression it's, it's more about the emotion of the image than it is the color. Frankly, a lot of times color can be a distraction, whereas black and white really makes things pop. Another black and white of a marine iguana in the Galapagos Islands. Again, this one's raised up. Sometimes they're laid down. I wasn't worried about the body. I had a nice you know, background, and, and this was all about the texture, the pattern, the scales, all the features on the head of this beautiful creature. I mean, I love reptiles and amphibians. So a close portrait in order for you to experience a lot of the different elements on these spectacular creatures in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, shooting some deer on a ranch. Um, Jennifer Warner, a photographer at Wildside, uh, does a big bucks and birds. And that there's tons of giant bucks on this ranch. And the owner doesn't really do hunting. So that they, they, they'll rut right in front of you. They're, they're not running off. And in this particular image, it's almost like a mirror reflection. So I wanted the, the viewer's eye to go to the first buck and then the second buck and then to go back to the flowers. And there's almost a tunnel in the vegetation behind it. And this, this lended itself perfectly to a vertical composition. I wasn't worried about all the other flowers to the left. This image isn't about the beauty of the flowers contrasting with the deer, although that's a side benefit of this image. This is about almost the perfect uh, offset between the front and the rear deer, deer uh, buck. And, uh, and, and this really, a vertical image, again, leads your, your eye right through that image really well in this composition. Now, here's one that if you ask me, why did I go vertical? Because it's not really a vertical subject, but I felt like this image demanded a vertical composition. And the reason being, it's more about the transition from light to dark. I mean, the light was just below the eye, and uh, I call this one darkness, darkness cometh. Because, you know, for a lot of these animals in Africa, darkness is a, I can't imagine the horrifying time of sleeping at night in the savanna with lions roaming around and many other predators and other creatures, right? So as, as, the, as the shadow, literally from one of his neighboring um, um, buffalo comes up and the light is just below the eye, I wanted to emphasize that transition of light that's about to happen on that eye. One of my favorite images I captured in Africa. And, and why did I go vertical? Horizontal would have included more of the horn and more of the body, which would have just been a distraction. This image is all about what's going on with the, with the light and the eye, and color wasn't necessary. I mean, these animals don't have much color, and black and white really emphasizes the drama of the, the changing of the light. So here's a mountain goat in Glacier National Park, and this particular image is an environmental shot, 
And with the gap in the trees I was shooting through, a horizontal, it would have been a, a just an absolute mess. As I like to say, it would have been a dumpster fire shot if I'd have taken a horizontal. But a vertical shot, the gap flows vertically, the mountain goat's almost looking down, the, the, the crack on the rock, everything about this image is about up and down. The only thing that is side to side might be the lines in the rock, but they're so minute in this image, it's not competing with your view. You go to the mountain goat, his head is looking down, and you go right down that channel. Again, a vertical subject, and, and there's the vertical subject in this image is not just a mountain goat. It is the element of what's in, in what's sharp. That's the subject is the mountain goat, the trees, the rocks, you know, the, the warm light hitting the lichen in the back. That's the subject. It's not just the mountain goat in this image. So another type portrait where I felt vertical was going to minimize the distractions. The color of the water wasn't that pretty, so it wasn't like I needed more water. Um, and this, this uh, lioness had just finished... Uh, feeding, you know, being with her cubs and she wanted to drink. And I wanted to emphasize the beautiful way that cats drink and the way their tongues do and, and the eye. So I took a ton of shots and some of them, the eyes looking down, up, not in a good angle. And it was about finding a shot with the eye just in the right position, the tongue in the right position, and really just, just getting in tight and vertically from the eyes to the mouth, that's vertical. Horizontal, I would have had a lot of crap either off to the left that wasn't attractive or off to the right, I would have just shown more of her head or her body, which had nothing to do with the action that I was trying to capture. Some mating jaguars in the Pantanal from last August. <clears throat> I, I shot vertical on purpose. Most people were shooting horizontal. I wasn't interested in the whole body on these animals. I was interested in the facial expressions of what was going on, you know, the intensity of this moment, at least for the male, and the complete apathy, it's almost seemingly on the female's part in this image. And so vertical for me was emphasizing what's going on at the front end. I'm not worried about what's going on at the back end. I'm worried about the elements of, of the facial expressions, of the color, of the intensity in that male's eyes, of his ear position. You know, um, reproduction for cats is not a pleasant experience for a variety of reasons that I won't cover in this video. Here's a coyote in Yellowstone in winter. Again, vertical composition. He's vertically oriented and his head is up. It's a nice, strong posture. The tail's in a great position. The legs are in a good position. I love the touch of snow on the nose and uh, the eyes. Love this image. And it just screamed vertical composition. Now, proof that a couple of times in my life, I have photographed domestic animals, which generally bore me to death. But this is an Icelandic horse. And, I, you know, the light just screamed photograph this horse. So I put this in here as proof that I have on a couple occasions in my life photographed domestic animals. And uh, again, this is all about the light, the backlit, the wind blowing, the mane just right, the one eye, the ears, the eye, the nose, the, the mane. It's all about vertical. Horizontal would have included more of the horse's body, which is meaningless to this image because it's not as backlit, it's not as pretty, or just a bunch of dark background which would not have contributed to the image. This is uh, from January in Yellowstone when, when we had that incredible wolf bison hunt. And you can see the intensity on the juvenile, the black wolf. He's staring at the bison. But look, you've got the alpha female yawning, completely not worried, not intense. She knows that this is eventually going to play out. And another beautiful one of the gray wolves back behind her, another female. And look at how relaxed their body posture is compared to the juvenile, right? They have a lot more experience and, and the juveniles were allowed to do a lot of the work until it became really time to do some stuff. So this image by going horizontal to the left was just that, that branch became obnoxious junk, but a vertical composition, you, you work your way through the three wolves because the, 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 the composition forces your eye that way. So we go with the sharpest wolf in the front, then the yawn of the alpha female behind him, and then the third wolf. And it's just this nice kind of curving transition. Your eye goes through it naturally. Nothing, nothing distracting you on the left. Same, the same time, same bison hunt. And when this bison, this was near the end for the bison. Um, and near the beginning for the wolves in a lot of ways. But you see this bison coming out into the water. And, and at this point, it never did come back out of the water. Let's just say that. 
But look, the, out of all these frames I shot, I had two where the eyes really communicated what was going on. If you look back in the back, the wolves that are partly out of focus, two of the young ones are licking the blood on the ground. But the alpha female, she's not even paying attention to the wolf. She's just hanging out. Whereas the bison, its eyes tell the whole story. You know, it it it's it knows that good things are not happening for it, you know. And so, you know, it's getting into this colder water. They force it to stand in the cold water for almost a full day. But the eyes draw you into that image. And again, a, a horizontal composition, I'd had too much junk. There were other wolves that would have been clipped. There was uh, branches that weren't that attractive. And in this image, I knew a vertical composition. Now, thank God the bison was walking right at us. Had the bison been sideways, a vertical composition wouldn't have worked. The image would not be nearly as powerful, I think, as this particular image is. Or if the wolves had been in focus and not the bison, it would not have been a powerful image. Oh, man, I'd been waiting for a moment like this. This is the most hoarfrost I've ever seen. Um, it got down somewhere... We were pushing close to minus 40 on this particular day. Why did I go vertical? Well, you could argue for horizontal composition, but the tree in the background is what makes this image in a lot of ways. And you would have clipped off a lot of that tree. It would have looked, would have looked stunted. In a vertical composition, I would have liked for that bice in the back to be a little bit more in line. Get with it. Follow the program. But a vertical composition, the animals are walking towards us. And that tree is what makes the background so nice for me. You know, there's so much steam coming off the river right there that, that it's just hazy enough, but it's also just clear enough to make you feel like it's not just a barren wasteland. And I think the tree contrasts nicely with the bison in that image. Now, some of you may say, oh, he didn't shoot that vertical. Yes, this is 100% shot vertical. Um, when I saw, so, so that's the alpha male and a, and a lot of the young wolves around him. Again, why I shoot 50 frames per second? I had one frame that had that 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 uh, alpha male doing that grimacing. Um, if you're shooting at 20 frames per second, you very likely miss that. But when they were running down the hill, I went vertical because there was this kind of vertical channel on the snow. And again, our eye goes right to the face of the alpha male. Then you look at these these younger males around him, and you go follow the follow the group right up the hill. Again, a horizontal composition would have had a lot of vegetation on the side, a lot of elements that did not lend themselves to this image. Bison breathing in, in again in Yellowstone. And, and this image is as much about the bison, and it's as much equally about the, the steam coming out from its breath. So I wasn't worried about having a lot of the bison in the image. I really wanted people to experience the cold that this bison was experiencing. So again, a horizontal would have had a lot of plain bison hide on the left. And I say plain, I have a bison hide back there on my bed that I use for my main heavy coat that's the best thing to sleep under ever. Or the right would have just been a lot more white. And it would have, the more white on the right would have distracted from the steam in front of the bison's body. A backlit cactus wren preening in Big Ben, shooting vertical. I had a client with me and I kept telling him, just shoot, just shoot. He was chimping and... Uh, of course, didn't get a shot like this because he got 30 shots. He said, I think I've got it. And I said, I don't think you do. This bird is preening if you're patient. So I just kept firing away. Bam. And eventually all 10 retresses, those are the tail feathers, right? So all 10 of them get spread out. And as this bird's preening, backlit, beautiful subject, beautiful background. A horizontal composition would have included a lot more branch on either side. You know, this is a, a dead mesquite and more ugly branches on the right. Vertical composition, isolating the bird, um, and, and drawing your attention to that beautiful backlit tail feathers. A portrait of a rogue runner. Now, you're going to laugh when I tell you, A, it's a vertical subject, right? And going vertical, emphasize just the head. This rogue runner would hop up on the side mirror of a car and fight the rogue runner reflection in the window. And it would be facing the entirely wrong way. And I had a client off to the right who was shooting the Roadrunner with the car in the background. I kept saying, come here, come here. He goes, I've got it, I've got to go. Come here. He never listened to me, okay? But when the Roadrunner would get so into fighting, it would slip, and when it would slip, it would jump up on the edge of the side mirror and be looking right at me. So I just sat there patiently waiting. 
it slipped, boom, beautiful background, firing away, and you can see the incredible eyelashes on this bird. You can see, you know, I love Roadrunners. Their plumage is spectacular. Here you really get a good look at the depth, you know, the real serious texture to its feathers. And when I said, I finally got my client after the, the bird jumped down, I said, this is why I was calling you over here. And he goes, oh, I didn't get that. I said, of course not. The cameras, the cars in your background, right? So trying to get them over. If you're, if you're on a workshop or in a class and one of your leaders is saying, come here, come here, come here, come here. It's because we want you to come get a certain kind of shot, you know, and, uh, and, and learning how to read a scenario and when to do that. Again, gray blue herons are primarily a vertical subject, right? Now, you might have elements in a background that might make it more horizontal, but when you come to birds that are very tall, they often lend themselves better to a vertical shot. Again, this penguin, they're vertical by nature, but when he does what I call his dragon pose, way more, way more vertical in nature. I mean, the wings, the head angle, th this background, I, I love the way this image plays out. Here's a little lark species in Zimbabwe, and one of the challenges of shooting vertical and shooting tight is, what happens if you clip the wings? You know what? Sometimes I do, and those get they just throw them away. Every now and then you clip wings, and there's nice symmetry or something else is going on. It makes for a good image. But here I happen to capture very brief uh, flicking of the wings while it was sitting on the perch. A Franklin species. I, this isn't black. I can't remember the name of this one. From Zimbabwe. Most of our clients had quit photographing. I kept working the truck closer and closer. They said, you know, in that mindset of, I got it. I got it. Well, what did you get? Did you get a picture of that bird or are you trying to capture the shot of that bird? I'm all about the shot and by kept shooting, kept, by now I'm standing up in my seat in the safari vehicle and most everybody else has done photographing and then all of a sudden this guy's printing and he shakes it out and I love this shot, the head sharp, feet sharp, you know, but and part of the plumage, but then the part of his body, you can tell that movement, right? When they shake out and then you can see the feathers, the loose feathers and dust and whatnot coming off. Love that shot. Shooting tight, um, we had a natural death uh, on a wildebeest and there were no predators around. My local guide let me get out of the vehicle. I got down low and I love this image of, I think this is the bearded vulture. I could be wrong. Um, I don't worry about all the species IDs on my images anymore. I've gotten over that need. But for me, this image beautifully illustrates, I think, how amazing vultures are. And by shooting tight and vertical, Yep, I, there were a lot of images before that didn't work and a lot of images after that didn't work, but this one worked. Um, these beautiful, I think these are called red-legged cormorants or red-legged shag. I, I always forget the name of them down there on the Peruvian coast. And by shooting vertical, vertical subject, right? But when he goes to shake his head and he flings that water, look at how that water curves so beautifully. A vertical shot emphasizes that. Horizontal, I'd have had a lot more space with nothing going on besides vertical. And now this is in a moving skiff on the ocean with waves, taking lots of shots. And you know, you can't, you can't get chintzy when you're in a boat doing this with rough wave action, that's hardwood boat. So kneeling on it hurts and your camera's doing this. You got to shoot away again. Same thing. I shot tight. I want to go vertical to emphasize that the head on this puffin, I can't control when they're going to shake this stuff off. But the vertical shot gives just enough space above the head for these to stand out. Horizontal would include a lot more blurriness from the wings. This is all about what's going on in the head. Yes, I do a lot of bird in flight vertical. Backlit subjects, I was waiting for them to fly in front of this beautiful dark cliff. One of my three favorite birds in the world, the swallowtail gull and the Galapagos. The wing position, the tail, I would have preferred a better head angle but I love this image from, from beginning to end. Just if, if I said, what would I like to change? Just tweak the head a little bit more towards me. Now, I know a lot of y'all think there's no way you shot this vertical. This is 100% a vertical shot. This is a, a Kokoi heron taking off in <clears throat> Brazil. That is a greater re in the background that was jumping up to grab uh, fruits off this tree. So I see the Kokoi heron. I'd been photographing the Rhea. I had no idea about getting a shot with both of them. So I see this Kokoi heron walking out of this ditch onto a road, and I'm shooting vertical because it's a horizontal vertical bird. Now, I knew when it went to spread its wings to fly, I might clip it, but I also knew it would fly in front of me, and I just wanted a unique, tight flight shot. How in the world can you predict this? You can't, but by preparation plus skill times patience 
you get luck, right? And here we go, a two species image. I love it. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things that you, you, you can't plan for it, but you can do as much as possible to allow for it. Again, another bird in flight, a Northern Harrier. This was during a bird in flight workshop. I had several images in front and back that got clipped, but I got the one. Beautiful light, beautiful background. Uh, vertical, to emphasize the wing position, I knew this bird was gonna bank in front of me. Could have gone horizontal, but I probably would have had a lot more of the buildings too that were uh, behind me as well. And again, beautiful backlit crest of Caracara in Brazil. Nobody else in the boat bothered to stand up. I shot this vertical because I knew that I wanted more of that beautiful dark background, the backlit bugs and the feathers on this bird, beautiful image. Again, vertical subject, nice dark background. By shooting vertical, we go to the eye, we follow the bill, the tongue, down the body to that lit part of the branch. This was a, a Brazil is the best spot I've had for photographing kingfishers in terms of them being cooperative. This is a giant flock of sandhill crane at Bernardo Wildlife Recreation Area in New Mexico. And so you could have shot horizontal and you would have shown a ton of these birds. But this is about isolating an individual from a flock. And oftentimes vertical works great for that. It's a vertical bird, tall bird again. And a, a horizontal shot would have included a lot more distraction on birds that were nearby that would have also been in focus. Vertical isolated those birds. And so I have the one bird in focus and almost all of them just as it just gradually fades further and further out, out of focus. I wouldn't have liked this if I'd had a blue sky behind it. You probably wouldn't be seeing this image. And I love this um, portrait of a wood stork I just took in Florida the other day. You almost never get to photograph a wood stork with the crashing waves of the ocean behind it. This guy was down there begging from fishermen and very lucky he walked down right on the beach. So I love the beautiful kind of soft pastel type textures, very ethereal feel. And of course a wood stork's head and neck are very much driven by vertical composition. Yes, taken vertically, uh, osprey in, in flight with a fish heading to a nest. Again, is it luck? Well, preparation plus skill times patience equals luck. I was shooting vertical. I got that shot and I was, oh yeah, there it is. There it is. And a horizontal would just include a lot of background that would be unnecessary. Here's a snow goose at Bosque. And again, I like to isolate individuals in flocks and herds. And this vertical shot is perfect for that. The subject is vertical, right? And the background, it, you have this depth created by out of focus geese in front, out of focus geese in the back, and this nice sharp guy right in the middle. Another one where by going vertical, I'm eliminating some of the distraction on the sides. I'm giving a lot of that beautiful color in front of the sandhill crane, happen to get it drinking and the water flowing back down. Love this image. Plus you have some warm and cool elements. So your eye starts in the warm elements at the front of this image and it goes back to this nice cool. I mean, I love the transitions in this image. Had there been a lot of sandhill cranes around this one drinking, this you wouldn't be seeing that image. It wouldn't be that good. But every now and then you have to crop to vertical. Here's an image I cropped to vertical. There you go, folks. If you stayed this long, and I bet a lot of you didn't, if you stayed this long, here's a cropped image. Why? Because there was a lot of useless information on both sides. And the wing position, I wanted, again, I wanted to bring the eye from the front where the reflection is. And it's not the crispness of reflections because of the wind movement, but the color there, you know what it is, and to flow up and enjoy. I love the positioning of the primaries and secondaries, the tail, the legs. There's nice separation in the feet and the legs. The head is at a good angle. We have full view. Uh, and this guy was literally jumping and then diving for fish and acting. And I, yep, I cropped this one. I was shooting uh, horizontal because it was so unpredictable in behavior that vertical, I, if I were shooting my normal tight vertical, I probably wouldn't have got a shot. It was so unpredictable. Um, what this guy was doing. You know, it's like Uncle Jerry at Christmas. If he's had half a bottle of liquor, you have no idea what Christmas is going to be like. Same thing. Now, how about focus stacking or focus bracketing, which is what I do, and vertical. So in the Galapagos, you get so close to frigate birds that with the 150 to 400, even if I'd have gone F-16, the background would have been sharp. 
but even the tip of the bill wouldn't. So this is focus stacked using a very shallow depth of field, right? So I was probably at f5.6. And then I focused on the front of the bill. I took a series of images until the back of the bird's head was in focus. And then using uh, Helicone um, software, I merged these into this beautiful focus uh, stacked image. So I don't like to do focus stacking camera much. I, again, I'm a control freak. So I do it in a third, uh, third party software after the fact. All right, nature photographers, I wanna go over a few tips and techniques for shooting vertical. First, I'm gonna do landscape and night sky, then I'll do macro and then wildlife. So normally when I'm shooting landscape, uh, quite often I'm on a tripod, particularly for long exposures. Yes, I've handheld this thing at two and a half seconds tack sharp, but the reality is it's a whole lot easier to guarantee a nice sharp shot when you're doing long exposures using something like tripod. I will do a video at some point on my favorite tripod. This is the Photo Pro E6L. I love a lot of things about it, but that's not the point of this video. Now, <clears throat> on this particular body, this is the EM1 Mark III with a trusty 12 to 100 on it. Yes, I still have a Mark III. I use it for camera trapping, uh, but this has an L bracket on it, okay? L brackets, there are many different manufacturers. There's a wide variety of pricing. Some are de designed very specifically for a camera body. There are some more generic companies, three-legged thing. I know Emily Talpin, another OM system ambassador. She's been working closely with them. She loves their products. This is, I believe, Kirk Enterprise. No, this is really right stuff, L bracket. The one thing about this tripod with an L bracket was to shoot vertical. If I were shooting horizontal, I wanted to go vertical. I had to take the camera off, okay? And I would have to spin the camera around or spin the tripod head around, and then I'd have to mount it like this. I, I would undo this, spin this back, because I like having the controls at the rear, right? And then I would reattach the camera, because I always want the shutter speed on top. Now, frankly, a lot of the time when I'm shooting, I'm using a remote shutter if I have it on the tripod. But even to do vertical with the controls where I want them, I would have to flip it. Well, thankfully, I don't have to do that anymore. And you could say, well, you know, if there are other tripods, like with a ball head, that you wouldn't have to do that. Yes, but this has a self-leveling head. I, I just love everything about this tripod. So recently, instead of using an L bracket on my cameras, I came across a new device. This is called the Atoll. Um, Emily Talpin sent me this one. She wasn't really using it and uh, we're good friends. And so fortunately she said, here Lee, why don't you, I think you might get some use out of it. Why don't you take it? So here's the beauty of the Atoll D. Now, Nisi makes one, many other companies make one. This is called a lens collar. You know, this is a rotating lens collar. It mounts to your camera. You would want to do some research. I know for the, uh, this is a Mark I. No, I'm sorry, this is a Mark II. Um, that I need the little spacer added in here to make sure there's plenty of room. You can see that little spacer. And what this rotating collar does, simply like this, boom for lenses that don't have a lens collar. So let's say I'm shooting horizontal, okay? I'm shooting some horizontal landscape shots and now I wanna go vertical and I like my controls on top. So all I have to do is loosen the, control, the, the uh, tightener up here on top, rotate my camera vertical, boom, I'm ready to keep shooting. And I like having the gimbal controls on the left rather than my right. I want my shooting hand uh, because I'm right hand dominant. It's much easier for me this way. So now all I have to do to go back and forth is simply rotate the camera in the collar. Now there are some complaints by some people that there's not really enough room. If you, uh, if I, if I rotate the camera like this, you can see it's pretty tight here on the side. Well, to be honest, that's not going to bother me much. I have a pretty strong grip, but I could see how that would having such a tight spot right here. I could see how that would bother some people. So this may not be the solution for you in every circumstance. This body will be landscape, night sky, macro. I'm not gonna have any trouble um, hand holding this even if I put my fingers here or down here. But again, for landscape and night sky, now I have the perfect solution. Vertical shot. And what I like, if you listen, you hear that click? That click lets me know I'm at vertical. That click lets me know I'm at horizontal. You don't even have to necessarily retighten the collar, but when you're talking to someone who's OCD, control free, I'm, I'm going to tighten that back down just for security. So again, easy enough to go back from 
from vertical to horizontal. It means I probably won't be buying L brackets anymore since this is my favorite tripod. It means I'll probably be using these. Although if I have, uh, I have other tripods, I, I have a thing for tripods, I don't get rid of them. Um, I could still use the L brackets easily enough, just rotate my camera on that. So this is the Atoll lens collar. Again, some people are not gonna like it because of this very tight space here but I don't think that's going to bother me in the least. It might others. All right, now let's let's talk macro. Now, on my macro bodies, I don't have a grip, right? And I told you that I only use grips for wildlife bodies. Well, this body has no grip because for landscape, this is the 90 millimeter, the F3.5 Pro, and this is as big a macro lens as we get. So in comparison to my hand, it's pretty small, lightweight lens. What's funny is I heard some of y'all complaining about this. Did you not own the Canon 180 f3.5 that weighed like a concrete brick? Some of the things people gripe about is mind boggling. So again, I can easily handhold this one hand vertical with flash, with a flash diffuser. That's not gonna be a problem. Now, normally I'm gonna put my hand down here for a little more support, but I don't feel like I need a battery grip. I don't need the extra battery power for macro. I don't need that grip functionality. This works just fine. And because I'm normally so close to my body, so tight in, this I save the weight with not adding a vertical grip. So to shoot, shoot vertical with macro, I'm gonna have a really good strong grasp here, okay? If I've got my uh, macro diffuser on, I might have to grab it a little more further back. But again, no problem even hand holding one hand with this set up. So that's going to be how I'm going to do macro shooting vertical. Now let's talk about shooting wildlife vertical. For me, having a vertical grip is an absolute no brainer. First off, I shoot a lot of wildlife images. So the second battery is absolutely critical for me. I would not consider going out to shoot wildlife without having two batteries in the camera. I don't want to waste time swapping batteries as much as possible. But when it comes to shooting vertically, I shoot wildlife pretty much 100% handheld. The only time I might use a tripod would be to get my arms a little break. Uh, might be doing high speed hummingbird flash photography, or it might be doing um, blind photography. But for the most part, it's handheld. And for me, the best technique for shooting vertical is to, to keep the lens collar at the bottom. That allows me to easily control the zoom with my thumb and fingers. So right here, you can see underneath how I hold that. Plus. If I need to do a little manual focus tweaking, my index finger just reaches just enough perfectly to make minor adjustments manually. So I've got my vertical grip, so I've got my controls at the top easy enough to use, and here, bam, nice and stable platform, elbows in. Now I can rotate my zoom, I can manually tweak if I need to, all of it right there. Now, again, depending on your hand length, your finger length, this may work great. It may not, you may have to make some, some adjustments. Sometimes depending on situations I'm in, because I have a good grip, I sometimes will hold it like this, particularly for birds in flight, right? So those are a couple of options, but generally vertically speaking, vertically speaking, I am going to shoot this way with the lens collar underneath, the lens foot, I'm sorry, underneath, and then just a little bit of technique like this. So those are a few tips, techniques, on how to shoot your images in vertical composition and give yourself a heads up. Thanks for watching guys. Be checking out Wildside website for OM system only workshops. Would love to have you join me. Stay tuned in the future for some more great videos. This one was very in depth. I'll do some short ones coming up, but what can I say? I love to teach. Thanks for being with me.